starting a business is what we did eight years ago, me and my friend Patrick. And when I told my brother, my older brother, and I said, you know, we're, we're leaving our jobs, we're going to start a company. He said, interesting. Starting a business or robbing a bank, ten years either way. Of course, I didn't believe him. Took, uh, took about eight years to where we are now, but at that time we couldn't even consider that. We thought, it's a you know, couple of years down the track and we'll be fine, we'll be in the US ringing the NASDAQ bell. We left two high paying jobs, international careers, felt fantastic. Our business idea was great. And then eventually we, um, uh, we decided to sit down in my apartment and uh, founded the company, signed all the papers. It took us about two weeks to get the paperwork back and I'm not kidding, the week after we'd started the company, I come home met by five thick envelopes from the IRS or the US tax man. Turns out that I spent five years in, in California working and my company had forgotten to pay some of the taxes. I had moved back five years prior and this has caught up with me. Interest rates, penalties, interest rates on those penalties plus the taxes. We had saved up two years worth of salaries to run this company and I was wiped clean the first day, or the first week we started. Since then, we sold our cars, we moved to smaller houses, or apartments I should say, and we lost about the same amount of hair. <laughs> we uh, also hit a financial crisis, all of those kind of things. So, today, eight years later, we employ over 200 people in 10 countries, and people often ask me, how did you get here? And during this time, they asked me, how can you even stay doing this? How long are you going to give this? Why don't you just give up? So uh, today, I'm going to try to explain a little bit of what I've thought kept us going. What was it that kept, uh, kept our energy going? Well, three things. Very many meetings. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And when I say meetings, everybody thinks about you know, the draining kind of stuff. You fall asleep. In fact, 39% of people have fallen asleep during meetings. Somewhere between 25 to 50% of meeting time is wasted. 70% of us bring other work to meetings. We all recognize this. But I would be wrong to try to say that the meetings is what got us here in terms of how we value them on the business outcome. Rather, it is on some other way of deciding whether a meeting is a good one or not. And it's energy. In fact, they're looking at it this way, there are only two kinds of meetings you can have. The ones you come out of with more energy or the ones that you come out with less. Every meeting we, have, we go into, we can, of course, try to make as much impact on the people around us, but it's also what we come out of the meetings ourselves and what we do with that energy. And the first meeting I had that really impacted this company was well, well before we even thought about starting a company. It was nine months before I was born. I met my twin brother. Now, I don't remember much from that meeting, but <clears throat> according to my parents, I came out of that meeting full of energy, in fact, screaming. I think my brother was too, so it must have been a good one. The interesting thing is that having a twin brother, living with him, going on parallel tracks with somebody that you always have nearby, that can always witness what you do, is a really interesting experience if you fast forward to my tender age of 44. Because when we started this company, I could have never done this myself. I met Patrick, my co-founder, at Ericsson where I used to, be, used to work, and he's now my sort of surrogate twin. Because it turns out I can't work unless I know somebody is appreciating my work. I can't even mow the lawn or do the dishes at home unless I know somebody's at least sitting there on the couch appreciating me somehow. And if it weren't for Patrick, I would have shot myself many times over if I'd have had the energy. Remember the Lehman Brothers crash? I do. Because we had worked six months to get our venture capital pitch ready to get five million euros for our startup that was going the right direction, but rather slowly. Unfortunately, 
Lehman Brothers crashed around about the same month as our uh, pitch for the venture capitalists was ready. Needless to say, not all of them said yes. In fact, all of them said no. We kept meeting, and we kept meeting, and we kept meeting. And eventually, we got hold of one company, one venture capitalist, who said, uh, sure, we need to show this to our senior partner. And then we get to the senior partner. You know the type, the 55-year-old man. They're the typical, have done a great career, have some money, have great connections. They can really make or break your company. And when you meet with investors, you meet with a lot of 55-year-old men. The only diff sometimes the only difficulty with these are that they also know how the world works. So we got into our venture capital pitch and we showed them the Gartner curves, showing projections of how mobile was taking over the world, how 3G networks and everything was just supporting our business. And on the third minute, I hold up an iPhone that had come out one year earlier, and I said, and, I said, and this has helped, us business, helped our business grow even faster. And then he says, stop right there. I don't need to hear anything else. And I'm dumbfounded, and he says, I don't believe a single number that you've shown me and besides, the iPhone is a shit phone, and nobody will ever use their phone for the internet. This was in 2009. Now, of course, needless to say, we didn't get any money out of him. And we kept going and kept going, and it took us another three and a half years before we got our first external venture funding from a venture capital firm, because they, they kept saying no. But what happened after this meeting well, first of all, despair. Uh, we, I think we had uh, less than a thousand euros left on our bank account, but it, we sort of somehow managed. But after a while, this turned to anger. And that anger made us very, very energetic to tell him, I told you so. And this little piece of vengeance, if you like, where we can go back and say, I told you so, feels great now that we can tell him so. So this meeting gave us a lot of energy, and of course we had lots of meetings saying no, and everyone that says no, we first feel misunderstood, and then we feel we want to sort of prove them wrong. We want to prove that we were right and they were wrong, even though they had had great careers and they knew how the world worked. We just wanted to show it to them. So this energy that we got, as I mentioned, it came from anger, and anger is an emotion. And that's really what drives the energy in meetings. And if we look at that question mark, there are lots of different emotions we can have. In this case, it was anger. Anger apparently drives a typical behavior, much like sadness drives one behavior, happiness another, and anger a third. Anger drives stubbornness. So the additional benefit of being able to feel like we wanted to tell him, I told you so, we wanted to tell him every day, and we still do. <laughs> but why did he say no? That's something that we will never really know, because he gave us a bunch of reasons. The iPhone was as he claimed it, and he said he didn't believe anything that we showed him. But why did he say no? Was it my part of the presentation? Was Patrick wearing the wrong tie? Did he not like iPhones? We don't know. But one thing that we did discover um, much, much earlier than starting this company was actually when I was on my first management training course with Ericsson. 18 years ago, I got a glimpse into where this, this reasoning or why he gave, he, why he said no. And it's really where emotions come from. So 18 years ago, I was selected with 30 other people that had never met each other at Ericsson to go out for three nights to understand why we wanted to become managers. And the first exercise when we get into this room, much like this one, is to, pe uh, to get in front of everybody and in three minutes or less give a presentation of who you are and why you want to become a manager. So we all, you know, get up in front of everybody and do our little pitch. And when it's my turn, I go up and say I'm Swedish. I grew up in Sweden until I was a teenager when we moved to Australia, which was fantastic because 
we were into windsurfing and we had windsurfing on our school curriculum. And after that, I went on to university and I coached hockey and, and that's when I realized I loved seeing people performing better than they thought they could themselves. And that's why I wanted to become a manager. I thought I nailed that presentation. So then everybody finishes their presentation. And then on to the next part of that exercise. And there are three psychologists working here. And they say, okay, now you do, what you do is you pair up with one other person, and remember you've never met any of these people, and you're gonna bring a chair and sit on a chair each opposite of each other. So we'll pull up chairs. I find, we, I meet one other guy who sits right opposite of me. And we look, sit like this, knocking our knees against each other. And the psychologists say, okay, are you ready? And we say, yes. Now the exercise is to look at the other person in the eye. No chit chat, nothing fancy. Just say, what do you feel about that person? So we're just sitting there and I thought I had a pretty good presentation, so this is gonna go great. So the guy goes, okay, who wants to start? And I said, why don't you go ahead? And he looks at me. I just squints a little and he says, you, you are one of those fuckers. <laughs> You're one of those no good, cares about only yourself, don't give a shit about anybody else, fucker. <laughs> I'm a little taken aback by this, a little. Luckily, the psychologist walking around come by and one says, how's it going? And I'm like, eh, not so great, I, I think. And I said, why is that? Well, he just told me how he feels about me. She says, so uh, Sven, how do you feel about Henrik? And uh, he says, well, Henrik is one of those fuckers, one of those no good, cares only about himself fuckers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust him for a second. And then she says, okay, well now we're actually getting to a new part of the exercise a little faster than we had planned. It took five minutes, and I was watching this, a psychologist and, I guess, instant patient, going at it for five minutes to find out why he felt this way. Turns out that he grew up on the east coast of Sweden, and every summer went down to an island called Gotland on the east side of Sweden. And he also liked windsurfing. Although he wasn't very good at it, it turns out. He had a big old board, and every year he struggled on that windsurfing board and every year there was a guy in a BMW that came down with a brand new board who was really good at it and he also had lots of girls. The second I said windsurfing, I released his ghost in the room. And this we all carry, we all have them all the time. They can be awoken any given moment for no reason whatsoever. Most of the time we don't even know about them. This guy had no idea that windsurfing triggered him that much. Of course, it's not just on the negative side. Why do people choose spouses or pets? I think these are only pets um, <laughs> that look like each other. Why does my liquor cabinet look like this? Why, do, why are there more lawyers with the name starting with an L or dentists with the name starting D than vice versa? Because there's a something, call it a ghost or the familiarity, it's actually called implicit self-esteem. We try to boost ourselves all the time. And because I work in marketing, I see this all the time. Who in here has a Go, uh, GoPro camera? I have two or three GoPro cameras. I've never flown off a hill in a wingsuit. I've never done a triple, triple black flip on a motocross bike, but I still have a sticker on my computer. Because I wanna be a hero. That's emotional marketing, and it's all about awakening your little ghost in the room. But I'm gonna talk about meetings. <laughs> and meetings is, of course, not just between human beings. It's also on your brand or any document that you see. And what matters in meetings is the emotion. And the emotion is what matters to drive energy. And then the last outcome of that is, of course, effect. 
So the energy that we've had to be able to survive has come from emotions that we've come from the opportunities to create those emotions, those meetings. But what about effect? Remember the 55-year-old man? We took his quote, created a newspaper ad and put it in a marketing magazine and printed it about one year after the fact. And I got a phone call one week later from the, one of the largest publishers in Scandinavia who said, I saw your ad, pretty funny, I'd like to work with you. That turned into be one of our biggest pivotal moments on the publishing side of our business in 2010. Great effect from a meeting that wasn't particularly good. But then, what if you don't have the meetings? And another publisher that I met, an entrepreneur, much like us in terms of age, much like us in terms of how far he had gotten, this was in 2011, we decide uh, he has a mobile site and a mobile application where he makes no money, and that's what my company does. We send money to publishers for their content, uh, advertising revenue. And I said to him, we can do this for you. You make no money on your mobile stuff, so we can send you money every month if you like. Would that be interesting? And he said yes. So we decided to meet on a Thursday morning. <coughs> However, on the Wednesday, I realized that we had forgotten to name the place where we were going to see each other. So I sent him this email, and it's very difficult to see on the screen, but it says, I realize we haven't booked a place for the meeting tomorrow. How about you coming to our office at 10 o'clock? Would that work? The answer I get is, screw the meeting. I don't have time for fuckers. Now, this was not the same guy. <laughs> but what we found out was that, well, I tried to email him, and I thought maybe he'd sent it to the wrong guy. I never got a reply. We never had the meeting, and we never sent him any money. And this year, we're sending publishers and entrepreneurs like him $40 million for their mobile assets. We didn't send this guy anything, and we probably won't. And the other thing I learned from that meeting is, of course, or that non-meeting, is that anytime somebody calls me a fucker, I take that as a good thing. <laughs> so what's the moral of the story? It's to make more meetings and make them matter. Nice meeting you, fuckers.